But if you can't tackle discretionary spending, you're not going to tackle mandatory spending. And importantly, and this is the critical part, you've got to have the political willpower to address these things. And that's actually why I came to the floor this evening. America was drawn in to an engaging debate among the members of Congress that represent them in the People's House last week. C-SPAN, not constricted by the rules of the House, was able to have cameras zeroing in on the members of this body as we were debating last week. And people were drawn into the conversations, the people on both sides of the aisle, and the, the drama of the debates, and how we would choose the Speaker of the House, and then whether we had passed the rules package. But here I am on January 11th, 2023, in the new Republican majority, and I am alone in the chamber again with the Speaker. That's a requirement, by the way. There has to be a Speaker and then a member on the floor. But I'm alone again. Now, we passed some bills today, but what are we going to do as a body to make good on the reforms we passed last week and actually extend on them and build on them? I would ask my colleagues why we don't have full debate right now on a number of the important issues of the day. Why we don't have full debate tomorrow, next week, the following week, on the crucial issues of our day. Today I called a colleague on the other side of the aisle to inquire as to which members of the minority party would be willing to sit down with me and anybody else to figure out how to deal with the debt and the deficit spending that is plaguing our country. And my colleague on the other side of the aisle engaged in a conversation about what that would take. But the fact of the matter is, I don't know the answer. And what I would say to my colleagues on the other side of the aisle is, come on down. Where are you? Are you going to simply take pot shots at any effort by members of my side of the aisle, the majority now, who dare to raise questions about how we might tackle $32 trillion of debt, trillion dollar plus deficits every year, tackle the question of interest rates going up, causing our interest payments to go up every year. Every 50 basis points, every half of a percentage point that goes up has about $100 billion a year in additional interest expense. I think in the next year, interest is going to eclipse our national defense spending. Now, where are all my defense hawks, all my Republican colleagues who like to stand up and say, we got to fund our men and women in uniform, we got to buy more planes, more bombers, we got to have more guns, we got to make sure that we have the strongest defense in the world. Great. I agree. Peace through strength, sparingly used, non-woke, trained to kill people and blow things up. That's what I want our military to be and to do. And I want it to be, continue to be the best in the world. But we're not going to be able to do that if we're spending more on interest of the debt than we are on our own national defense. And as the gentleman from Arizona rightly is pointing out about the state of our, quote, mandatory spending and, quote, entitlements, we're not going to be able to maintain this country and have a strong national defense and ensure a peaceful world for our children and our grandchildren. Those are just the facts. We used to have a lot of polit political back and forth between Democrats and Republicans. We would accuse our colleagues on the other side of the aisle of being tax and spend Democrats. Well, they were tax and spend Democrats. But then something changed along the way and we stopped debating tax policy for the most part. And now everybody in this chamber, for the most part, are spend and spend members of Congress. Spend and spend members of a unit party. And look, I'm all on board with the enthusiasm and the unity and the energy coming out of last week that we're going to transform this institution. I believe it. I believe by offering amendments in the appropriations process on the floor of this body will be better. I believe that by having 72 hours to read bills and not waiving that rule, 
that we actually do it, that we'll be better. I believe that by having single subject bills, without them being multi-subject and complicated and thousands of pages, that we'll be better. I believe that by requiring amendments to be germane, that is actually related to the underlying purpose of the, amendment, of the underlying bill, that will be better. Those are all things that will make us better. But they will only make us better if we're all united in the purpose of what we're trying to do. I know I've got very strong disagreements with my colleagues on the other side of the aisle. I have significant disagreements with a lot of, of my friends on my side of the aisle. But you'll never solve those disagreements if you never sit it down at the table and work. The only way to work is to put some sort of constraint on our spending. So with all due respect to my friend from Arizona, Mr. Schweikert, with whom I agree about mandatory spending and about having to solve those problems in the long term, discretionary spending matters. Discretionary spending matters because it charts the priorities of a Congress that represents the American people. We have to make the tough choices on discretionary spending. And oh, by the way, that they are only 20 or 25 percent of the overall spending does not mean that they're not insignificant. If we do not balance our budget right now and chart a course to balance that budget over the next 10 years, we will spend an additional $10 trillion over the next 10 years that we don't have. But what will happen is, and here's what's going to happen. This is important for the American people to understand. We reached an agreement as a party last week to ensure that we return to 22 levels of spending. That is a top line level of $1.471 trillion. That we operate with that cap in spending. That says nothing about what the levels are for defense or non-defense discretionary. Just that we would cap at 22 levels of spending. But here's what will happen. We'll have a debate about that. We'll pass some appropriations bills. If we do our job as Republicans, we'll pass good, solid bills for this year's spending that stick within those caps, that stay under the 22 levels of spending. We'll send them to the Senate. And Chuck Schumer will say, with all sorts of wailing and gnashing of teeth, that we are taking food out of the mouths of orphans and babies and that we're undermining the ability of people to survive and live and taking away their medicine and we're killing people and doing all sorts of horrible things. And as a result, it'll be September and we won't have an agreement and then there'll be some brinkmanship and a bunch of politics and a bunch of messaging and speeches and then there'll be a continuing resolution that fund government at the current levels that were passed in December under that $1.7 trillion omnibus spending bill that was passed on December 23rd using Christmas as a backstop. That's almost certainly what's going to happen if we don't stop it. There are two ways to stop it. Democrats and Republicans sit down and work honestly around a table to stop it or brinkmanship, forcing the question by bringing it to the brink. Those are the two possible ways that you try to stop what I just described from occurring, from occurring. This is the reality of what we've got to change in this body. What else is going to happen? Come summer, sometime undetermined, usually chosen by the executive branch as the maximum moment to be able to extract some sort of pain on the body, we will be told that the debt limit is going to be reached. That might be May or June or July or August. And then we'll be told you must raise the debt ceiling. And if any of us say, wait a minute, why are we going to raise the debt ceiling if we don't stop doing the things that's causing us to accumulate more debt? If any of us dare to say that, what will happen? Oh my, and it's already happening. With Wall Street Journal and all of the bond traders and stock traders and Wall Street, all of the investment bankers, all of the brilliant economists, all of the opposing political party will all say, don't default on the debt. 
You can't default on the debt. So don't you dare demand that we actually change the things we are doing that are causing the debt because we might default on the debt. So let's keep spending money we don't have, keep accumulating more debt, increasing our interest payments, making it more difficult to service that debt while we undermine our own fiscal accountability, our own bond ratings in the future. But no, no, don't you dare, Congressman Roy, say that you might use the debt ceiling as leverage to extract fiscal reforms to stop the insanity. Well, let me just be clear. I think it is critical that we change the way we're doing business. And I intend to use the debt ceiling to ensure that we get fiscal and structural reforms. And I'm not going to bow down just because a few of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle and a few pundits on TV write nasty editorials and some of my donors, some of the people out there in the world and activists text you and go, oh my gosh, what are you doing? You're going to risk default on the debt. You know why I'm not going to do that? Because it's my job not to back down when people are afraid of what we're supposed to do here. What we're supposed to do is bring things to a decision in this body responsibly. All last week while we were debating the speaker, a whole bunch of my friends, supporters, financial supporters, were blowing up my phone with text messages. A whole lot of them were saying, attaboy, stand up fight for the American people, change the institution. Let us actually try to make this place work rather than continuing down this road of destruction. But a whole bunch of them were also texting me saying, what are you doing? What are you doing? We're not going to have a Republican speaker. What are you doing? You're going to undermine us. We're going to get a Democrat speaker. You guys look like clowns. What are you doing? You look ridiculous. You're making the Republican Party look ridiculous, Chip. Stop doing it. Come Friday, after 15 votes, we come to a conclusion. Nobody died. Nothing went crazy. We got a Speaker of the House. We got some agreements among all of us about how the body should proceed, about ensuring we open it up, have transparency, offer more amendments get greater ideological diversity among the committees. Let's have a real debate on these things. Get, get a really strong committee on the Judiciary Committee, a church-style committee to look at how government's acting. That's what we got by standing up and fighting and ignoring all of the hand-ringers who can't stand the heat. Or stated differently, all of the hand-ringers out there in the Chamber of Commerce crowd and the donor class who basically want us to do their bidding so they can get richer. That's the truth. Don't default on the debt. That might hurt my financial bottom line, Chip. Don't you dare rattle and have debates on the House floor that might rock the boat, because my boat's pretty good, Chip. I'm doing quite well. Well, there's a whole hell of a lot of people in this country who are not doing well. And I'm not here to represent the donor class. I'm not here to represent the talking heads. I'm here to represent every hardworking American across this country, and particularly in my district, who are sick of the direction of this country. So I am glad that we had the debate we had last week. I am glad that we captivated the America's American people's attention. I'm glad that C-SPAN was free to show the conversation in the debates. I'm glad that we did something we hadn't done in 100 years because it's the two-party system entrenched that has broken down the ability of members of this body to actually be members. That's actually our job on a putting politics and partisan politics aside, it's our job as individual members of this body to come here and do our job. It's not our job, for example, to get on a committee and say and do whatever the chairman of the committee says, which, by the way, is one of the things that happens in this town. 
Our job is to get on the committee and work, debate, put good bills on the floor, amend those bills, debate those bills, pass some of those bills. It's also not a race to introduce bills. It's not a race to pass bills. What would be wrong if we only passed about 30 bills this whole Congress? Would that be a bad thing? What if we only passed the 12 appropriations bills, did our job, sent them to the Senate, passed a handful of bills that would actually make our country better, and then just sat back and worked a little bit and talked a little bit, rather than running down to the desk to file another bill, to introduce another statement, to do another press conference, to then run around and say, oh, we've got to pass a messaging bill. Oh, this is such and such week. This is the week for police officers, or this is the week for breast cancer awareness, or this is the week for whatever somebody in the Hallmark industry decided the week is for. Oh, well, we've got to pass a bill. Why? You think we lack laws? You think we lack regulations? You think we need to spend more money that we don't have? Why don't we just stop? Pause. My message to my Republican colleagues is, the best thing we can do for our country is stop doing all the things that this body has been doing for as long as I can remember. So whatever this body has been doing, let's do the opposite. How about that? How about we actually have this chamber full like it was last week? Why don't we have hundreds of people on the floor and debate issues in front of each other? Why don't we pick a day like Tuesday and call that debate day? And we have 50 members from one side and 50 members from the other side. Let's debate Ukraine in full view of the American people. Maybe the next week we can debate spending restraint. How are we going to tackle spending? I'd like to listen to my colleagues tell me, how do you plan on tackling spending? Because right now, my basic understanding of how my colleagues on the other side of the aisle would tackle spending is tax people or keep spending money or both. My view on this side of the aisle is we don't want to tax people, but we want to keep spending money in the name of defense. Anybody want to come challenge me on that assertion? Happy to debate them. Either side of the aisle, come on down, let's debate it. I don't think anybody will take that debate on because they know I'm right. Why don't we change that? Where are my colleagues on the other side of the aisle when it comes to spending? I'd like to know. I think the American people deserve to know. Do you believe in modern monetary theory? Just keep spending money and it doesn't matter? I don't. I think that's foolish. I think it's reckless. I think it undermines our dollar. I think it undermines our financial stability. More importantly, I think it makes it impossible for us to make good decisions about how to make policy and execute policy. How can you make a tough decision about whether or not you need to buy a bomber or whether or not you need to fund a particular grant program or fund a particular entitlement that is way oversubscribed and out of money? How can you make a decision about that if the answer is just keep printing money? I mean, that's my question. And, and I, I just would suggest there's no more important question for us to answer. Because if we don't, then we're never going to come to agreement on the policies, ever. If I go home and I talk to my wife and I say, look, we're going to cap our spending at our 22, 2022 levels of spending, then we've got to make choices. We've got to decide. Well. Are we going to just not make our mortgage payment? No, we got to do that. Are we going to not feed our kids? Well, no, we got to feed our kids. Are we going to have electricity and heat? Well, we'd like to have that. Then comes the discretionary questions. Do you take a vacation? Do you get a new car rather than patching together your 15-year-old car? Do you send your kids to a certain school? Do you save a certain amount of money for college? 
Maybe you forego college because you look at college and go, why am I going to spend $300,000 send them to a college that are going to teach my kids that America's evil? I'll save that for another rant. But that's my point. We have to do that as families. But this body never does it. Ever. We pretend to do it. We pretend to do it. The point of the agreement reached last week was to open this body up, empower rank and file, but also importantly, establish some parameters for how we fund the federal government. And those parameters should be that we set limits. And if you set limits, now you have to sit down and figure it out. But here's the problem. I don't believe that Chuck Schumer and Senate Democrats want to sit down at the table and figure out how to limit spending. I don't believe that the President of the United States or his current Director of the Office of Management and Budget or any of his team wants to sit down at the table with us and figure out how to limit spending. But I've not even heard him come down and say, well, fine, you're right, Chip. We're spending more money than we have, and we're racking up more debt, so we believe we need to increase taxes. Okay, well, come, come make your offer. We'll raise taxes. Okay, show me how raising those taxes is going to eliminate the deficit. He whispers, it's not. <laughs> show me how raising those taxes is not going to undermine economic growth, make it more difficult for American people to get jobs, undermine the prosperity of the American people. Show me that, come, come demonstrate that. Whispers, that's not really that easy to do. But our job is to responsibly represent the American people. It's not to govern. We often use that word. That's crazy. We don't govern. We represent. And our job is to represent our constituents. And I don't know any constituents, frankly, even my most left-leaning constituents, to be honest, I don't know any constituents who are saying, oh, yeah, please go up there and spend more money we don't have. I would just suggest that, according to the CBO, we're going to see another $15.7 trillion in deficits over the next 10 years. That's the truth. The truth is that in fiscal year 2022, we collected a record $4.9 trillion in taxes nearly a trillion dollars more than the previous year. We don't have a revenue problem, we have a spending problem. We have an overpromise problem. I had a reporter come up to me in the hallway a minute ago and said, Mr. Roy, is there any circumstances which you're gonna support providing more aid to Ukraine? How on earth are we having that conversation on January 11th after on December 23rd we just added another $45 billion for Ukraine. And the reporter responded and said, well, but they say that it's really important to get more money to beat Russia. Oh, really? Well, what do our experts say? And what is our responsibility to pay for that? Or do we just write a check anytime a world leader comes and says, but it's really important for my people that you write me a check. I know. I want someone to write me a check. Minus all the ethics stuff, don't go write all that. Look, the truth is, my colleague from Arizona, my friend from Arizona, Mr. Schweikert, is 100% correct that mandatory spending, Social Security, Medicare, all of the related expenditures that go along with that are driving the, the, the vast majority of the debt that we're accumulating every year. That is correct. But if you're not willing to take on discretionary spending, how are you going to take on Social Security, Medicare, and reforming those to work when the first ad that's going to be run is going to be pushing granny off the cliff if you dare even have a conversation about the issue? Will any colleague, I will make an invitation to any colleague in the chamber, but particularly my colleagues on the other side of the aisle, come down here and talk 
about Social Security and Medicare and all of our mandatory spending. But I'll issue the same request that my colleagues on this side of the aisle acknowledge that you cannot hide behind Social Security, Medicare, and mandatory spending to say that we shouldn't limit discretionary spending, defense spending, because, oh, that's an insignificant part of the budget. It is significant. And it is significant not just because of the trillions of dollars of debt that those spending accounts for defense and education and Department of Justice and Commerce and every other agency and Homeland Security. It's not just because we're spending too much money there and it's adding up to deficits and debts. It's because we're funding the very agencies that are undermining us. We're funding the bureaucrats that are undermining the current individual in America that's out there as an entrepreneur trying to get a job started. It's undermining my friend Scott Smith in Loudoun County because we label him a domestic terrorist because the FBI was brought in along with the National School Board Association. They all coordinated and said, okay, let's label them a domestic terrorist. We're funding a Department of Homeland Security that wants to continue to create or, or execute policies that invite more people to come to our border, endangering them and us. The reason you care about discretionary spending is because it funds the policies of government, of the bureaucracy, of the administrative state that undermines our well-being, undermines our prosperity. We have the opportunity now, right now, as Republicans, to lead the House of Representatives forward to change. We should, in fact, change. Last week was a monumental step forward to changing this institution, to opening it up, to allowing rank-and-file members to have a say, to putting more diversity on our committees, to having more debate in committees, coming down to the floor, and fighting for the people that we represent. But all of that will be for naught if we don't embrace wholeheartedly the mission, the hard mission, of limiting the spending that is destroying our country and demanding that our colleagues on the other side of the aisle come sit down at the table so that we can actually do our jobs for the people we represent. And then finally, sending a message to the United States Senate to the Democrat-led United States Senate, to the Democrat President of the United States at the other end of Pennsylvania Avenue, that it is not enough to give speeches, it's not enough to oppose what we produce out of the people's house. The American people spoke in November. They want us to be responsible. They want us to limit spending. They want us to secure the United States. They want us to have a secure and sovereign border. They want us to get out of their business. They want us to stop being at each other's throats. And if you want to do that, then embrace fiscal responsibility and stop spending money you don't have to fund the bureaucrats that are undermining our liberties. Stand up in defense of liberties, civil liberties, and the freedoms of the American people by calling out the bureaucrats in our committees and exposing it through oversight. Stand up for a strong military that is non-woke that is sparingly used, but ready to go fight when needed. Secure the border of the United States with the policies that are necessary to do so, and embrace radical federalism where we return powers to the states so we can agree to disagree and stop being at each other's throats. If you want to do those things, then there's one key thing you got to do. You got to fight the swamp. You got to take on the bureaucracy. You got to take on the powers that be. That started last week. We've, we've got some of the tools that we need, but that battle is just beginning. And we're going to take this town on for the American people. And with that, I yield back.